Good morning, Allen Bible. <laughs> Good morning. Hi. <laughs> We're glad to be with y'all today. Um, as you all know, we get to worship all throughout the week, but there's something very encouraging about just getting together to worship as we look at one another's faces, as we hear each other speak and sing, as we shake hands, as we get to be the presence of Christ to one another in person. And so uh, we want to invite you to participate in that with us this morning. So if you're able, we want to invite you to stand and we'll invite everyone to sing with us as we get to reflect on Christ this morning through singing, through listening to his word and more. Song with you, and I just want to teach you the chorus real quick. It 
talks about Christ being magnified in our life. And oh, Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified in the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Sing that again. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified.
Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Hey, let's pray together. God, that is our uh, desire this morning, that you'd be magnified in all that we say and all that we do. Um, God, we're grateful for those first few songs we got to sing this morning, just lifting our praise to you. Um, we know, God, there's people in this room who our feelings are not quite there. We don't feel some of the things that are expressed in those songs. That's okay, God. We pray you'd help our feelings catch up to the truth uh, that we just sang about. Uh, we know, God, there's folks here that may not even believe everything that we just sang because it's just sometimes hard to believe. God, I pray you'd help our belief uh, just grow stronger this morning and today. Uh, would you just work in our hearts, work in our lives? Uh, we are, um, again, desiring to magnify you in what we say and what we do. We know we fall short of that, but that is our desire. So we pray that you are honored this morning uh, by all that we say and do, and, and we're grateful to be together to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can be seated for just a few minutes. Um, if you're newer with us, again, thank you so much for coming to worship with us. We've we started off already this morning um, in a great way by singing some uh, just amazing truths through those songs, and we're grateful that you've joined us today to worship and to be in God's Word together. If you're newer, maybe you've never uh, been here before, or you've been here some that aren't fully connected into Allen Bible, we would love to get to know you and for you to know us. So there's a QR code up there that you can scan anytime here this morning. It's okay to take a phone out and, and click that. Um, there's also a card in the front um, chair in front of you, and you're welcome to fill it out. You can put it in the box in the back, or you can visit our welcome desk. We'd love to just get to know you uh, and make sure you feel connected into Allen Bible Church. Part of our worship, we say, is not just the singing or being here, but it's the giving um, to God what he's so generously given to us through our finances. And so if you're looking to invest in what God's doing here at Allen Bible Church, uh, both in these walls but outside of these walls, you can also use that QR code there, um, or you can give online or, or give in that box on the way back. And we just encourage folks to remind us that's part of our worship. Um, there's two short announcements this morning that I'm going to make, but while I start those announcements, we're also going to have a time where we um, highlight our student mission trips. So students and Jacob, you guys start making your way to the stage, and that way um, you're already headed this way, and I'm going to do these quick announcements. So um, two things. One is this worship, uh, this Wednesday night is our worship night. Uh, at 6.30, we invite everybody to come and join us here in our auditorium for um, just a great time of worshiping together as families. And then after that, we're doing popsicles on the patio. So uh, enjoy some worship, enjoy some hangout time afterwards. We'd love to invite you this Wednesday for that. And then um, for the young adults, your um, Monday night study is a supper and study this time. So um, you're meeting at the Hendersons at 6.30, so a little bit earlier than you normally do so that you can get dinner in as part of the package. What a good deal. So you got dinner and the study tomorrow night, Monday night. Is Jacob here? Oh, there's Jacob. All right, Jacob. Hey, good morning. Uh, yeah, this last week, um, this is our team of, of high school students that went to uh, For the Nations, uh, which is a ministry that ministers to refugees in the Dallas area. It's down in Garland. And this week, uh, we got to participate in their kids program that's going all through the summer. And so the way that it's set up is just uh, in the mornings, uh, we got to work with one group of kids, and then, uh, then, and then in the afternoon, we got to work with another group of kids, and so uh, we got to work with many different age groups, and so uh, we got to help these kids just learn how to read, do their math, homework, uh, and just kind of just just grow more in like their schoolwork and and things like that. And then we also got to participate uh, in just like Bible classes and gospel presentations. Um, a lot of nine square and gaga ball too. These kids are aggressive and very um, uh, they get into it, and so it, it was a lot of fun. And uh, so we, we have a couple of students that are just going to share uh, just some of their big takeaways um, from the week. And uh, so I'm going to start with Jack. And Jack, you go ahead. Thank you. Um, so coming to camp, I only had experience with um, poor, abandoned children in Romania. Um, so I assume that because the children this week came to America with so little, that they had come from so little in their home countries. Um, and even that they too could be abandoned. Um, I learned that no two refugee story is the same this week. Um, many of the children are first gen Americans um, and their parents could have lived in a typical home, been educated, held jobs before being forced into a refugee camp. Um, these refugee camps were extremely overcrowded um, with not enough food, water, or medical treatment. Um, being sent to America 
as a refugee was so little, for them was like a miracle, winning the lottery. It was a rescue mission. The children we played with, swam with, read to, and bonded with were born here, but this is part of their story. I'm so thankful to share his joy and truth this week. My perspective of those around me has definitely changed as I pray for more opportunities like this in the future. All right, and then I'm going to have Ashley share. Yeah, so um, one of the biggest things that stood out to me this week is just I wasn't really expecting the kids to be so eager to learn not only how to read or write, um, but about Jesus. They were so, like, um, ready just to hear his word and sing and then participate with that. Um, and then there were a couple kids that stood out to me that I was able to make deeper connections with, which is really special. Um, there was a girl named Lena. She was definitely one ball of energy. That's, she's, she drove a lot of the staff crazy, <laughs> um, and me. So, um, but it was really cool to hear her story um, and just hear how she was growing with her faith um, in the Lord and just um, learning his word. And I was able to be a part of that journey. So um, that was really special to me and that'd probably stick with me for a long time and hopefully with her, so. Um, just a few things. Um, there was a, a man, uh, Jean, he was from Rwanda, right? Yeah, so we got to, uh, one of the staff members, his name is Jean, and uh, he's from w Rwanda. He got to share his testimony and just his story uh, to all of us while we uh, got to eat some food from Burma, which was really good and really fun. Uh, but yeah, like what Jack was saying was like, the way that these refugee camps like work out is like they go to these camps and then like what Jack said, it's like it's almost like winning the lottery to get to go to a different country or get to go to the United States. And he was just so lucky enough to like almost like have that opportunity. And, and, and it's just crazy that um, that that's just kind of how it is. And I think it just opened our eyes this week and just um, just learning about that and hearing it uh, from from John and just other people as well. And just a couple things I was just very encouraged by this week was just our students. Uh, our team was told that uh, we just took the initiative a lot and we're just very involved and just very eager to help um, as well. And so our, our team was just told that we did a really good job in just helping and, and, and just uh, taking the initiative and things and even building relationships with the kids. Um, it, it was, it was kind of crazy how fast we could just connect with these kids and get to know them. Uh, so fast, but then also just the the team culture at for the nations uh, they have a really good uh, team culture where they their their interns their staff and their teachers and anybody else that's just involved was just so welcoming and like um, we had like a nine square tournament I think that got like I mean, we play nine square here it's like really relaxed but there it's like it's it's like really competitive and but they were just like so welcoming to us, and they were just so kind to us, and they uh, really just made us feel welcome, and it, it was it was a, it was a fun uh, fun time, and just getting to connect with the staff, and a lot of staff themselves were refugees as well, and so we just got to hear their stories and stuff, and um, I think it was like late at night, uh, I was just talking to the guys as we we're just kind of laying our air mattress, we were on air mattresses the whole week, but we were talking to the guys, and or I was talking to the guys, and somebody said, like, um, they said, like, you know, you, you see some, you see stuff on the news, and what the news, like, shows you, you kind of just make up your own perspective of, like, what, I don't know, different types of people might be like, um, and, but getting to be with them and, like, see it firsthand, it really just changes your perspective, and we were just, op our eyes were just opened, like, like, this is happening, like, here in Dallas, and we get to uh, just play a little part in it, and uh, and just and it opens our eyes, uh, even our schools as well. And so, I think it was just a really good week for us to uh, just change our perspective and our eyes uh, to be open as well. So, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Brian. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, will you guys, we're gonna pray and just thank God for that experience and for that ministry. So let's pray. God, we are grateful for uh, what you did this week through these um, high schoolers and just the opportunity they had to minister and be alongside uh, the Further Nations ministry. And we thank you for the hundreds and hundreds of kids that are part of that program each week um, and the families that are represented there that just come from, like they said, all over the world with different stories, with challenging stories. God, we know that you love them and care for them. Uh, thank you that our team here got to be a part of just loving them this week and, uh, and serving them. Uh, I do pray, God, as Jacob was just sharing, that 
the perspectives that were uh, kind of changed and the eyes that were open this week, God, I pray that would just give each of these kids and even us uh, just a, a new hunger for how we can serve and minister to those around us, um, to, to look with our eyes and see those in need and be willing to move toward them and not um, have those you know misconceptions or those preconceived notions that, that keep us away. Um, God, thank you again for the For the Nations ministry that throughout the year is ministering to so many different families uh, and, and meeting various needs. Uh, God, we do pray for your gospel to take deep root in the lives of many of those kids and those families and that they would not only see their lives change because of a move to America, but they would see their lives change because of the power uh, of the gospel and the power of what you have done in their life. We pray that that would be a realization for many of them. Uh, We know that that is uh, work that only you can do. And so, God, we just pray that that would be uh, what you are at work doing in their lives. Thank you again for this team. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Hey, our first through fourth graders are going to be dismissed back to their class here, and then we're going to stand and continue to worship through song.
pray together. Father, we thank you for that truth, that, um, God, that we can just think about your providence, how you provide for us daily. And, God, you give us just enough, um, God, and that we can hold fast and hold true to the gospel, that, um, God, you sent your son Jesus to be our rescuer and our redeemer and to, to fight the victory over sin and death and accomplish that for us. Um, God, we thank you for this morning, that we can open up your word. God, that you would speak to us and challenge us and encourage us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Y'all may have a seat. Good morning. Great to be back with you again this morning. So glad to, to be here. I hope your summer is going well and off to a good start. And uh, I'm always so privileged uh, when Buddy invites me to come back, and, and I'm always surprised, too, that you invite me back. But I'm also thankful that I have the opportunity to share with you again uh, today and to be with you. My name is Dan Martin, by the way. If, for those of you who I've not met and seen before, I'm uh, just glad to, glad to be here this morning. Um, we are in this summer series called Contrast, and about three weeks ago, Buddy kind of laid the, laid the groundwork for us in talking about this uh, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, and we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, and that's what we're going to be doing all summer. And um, Mike, two weeks ago, kind of kicked this off with the first 12 verses in Matthew 5, which are known as the Beatitudes. And just setting the stage for us today as we as we move into that, but just that's been been really uh, a good a good kickoff to what the Lord's going to open our eyes to this summer. And um, the 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 message this morning, as as I was preparing this message for today, really like every time I've read the Sermon on the Mount, opened my eyes to some new things. And open my eyes to some challenging things, um, but the the big overall reminder for us and what Jesus was teaching, living in contrast to the culture that we're in, living counterculturally in everything that we do, and the Bible reminds us that we are to be in the world, but we're not to be of the world. And when you and I get passive, when we get apathetic in our faith. We have a tendency to go into kind of this mode of coasting, and that's a dangerous place for us to be when we are coasting because we begin to drift, and drifting is very dangerous for the Christian life. It's really interesting when we think about drifting. Whenever we drift, we don't drift closer to Jesus. Drifting does not move us closer to this countercultural way of living that Jesus brought. Drifting usually means going with the flow. It means moving more towards the culture and how the culture is seeing things, how the culture is living out things. And so we have to guard against drifting. In those first 12 verses of Matthew that Mike spoke on a couple of weeks ago called the Beatitudes, we, what we had seen in these is Jesus calling his disciples, his followers, to some very intrinsic and internal characteristics. When we looked at things like um, being meek and, and gentle and, and peacemakers and all of these different things, merciful, those are great qualities that Jesus was, was teaching us about. And they were things for us that he modeled in his 33 years. They were characteristics of Jesus that we saw during his ministry here on earth for the 33 years. And talk about a contrast. Jesus is teaching this to these crowds, right? We've talked about the crowds that were there listening to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was not teaching to the crowds. The crowds were listening, but he was teaching to a very specific group of people, and that specific group of people were his closest followers, the people who were on board with everything that Jesus had to say, in contrast to 
the religious leaders of Jesus' day, who probably many of them were listening in, many of them were hearing, and much of what Jesus was teaching was in contrast to what the religious leaders were teaching in that day. And Jesus was the ultimate, uh, the ultimate when it came to living counter-culturally. And these Beatitudes and the, the, the truths that we're going to talk about this morning are invitations. They're invitations into living differently, living this kingdom life, finding joy and happiness in kingdom living. So in verse 13, which we're going to pick up in just a minute this morning, we're going to be reading Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Jesus is making a little bit of a shift here. He's shifting from internal and intrinsic characteristics to external, how we are to live in the world around us, how we are to be seen in our culture, how society looks at us. And remember, he's teaching to his closest followers. He's teaching to you and I. And I think that's really, really an important thing for us to keep in mind. And what we're going to discover in these verses this morning is that we are to influence and we are to bring change to the world that we live in rather than the world changing us, rather than us moving closer to culture and the, and the, and the current of culture, we are to live counterculturally. We are to swim upstream, if you will. So if you would stand with me as we read God's word this morning, and we're going to start in chapter 5, verse 13, and we're going to read through verse 16. And Jesus speaks this to his disciples. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this mandate and this charge that you have given us. And I pray, Father, this morning as we, as we talk more about these verses and what it means in our lives, I pray that your Holy Spirit would illuminate for us the truth of your word. Father, may it be for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. What I ultimately want us to see this morning is that Jesus calls you and me to be a reflection of him in our broken world. We talked about the fact that Jesus is addressing these specific people, these followers, these close followers of his, people that have laid down everything to follow Jesus. They've left relationships, they've left professions, They've left possessions, and they are all in. They are following Jesus. And, and in this, when Jesus addresses them, he uses the word you, and it's very important for us to understand that he uses the plural form of you. He is addressing them as a group. So we could even add in there, and I think there's even a Texas uh, uh, Bible version um, that would say, y'all, like all of you, y'all. It's, it's more than just an individual. He's speaking to them, and, and that's important for us because you and I, yes, we are to be salt and light individually, but it's our collective influence. Our, it's our influence and in our community that is really going to be what makes a difference in the culture in which we live. So the, the, the primary application here is for the church, capital C. The, the, the followers of Jesus collectively 
is what Jesus is talking about here. And these characteristics that he highlights, salt and light, these are mandates. These are mandates to the church as a whole, which will bring about influence and change in the culture in which we live. Rather than blending in with, Jesus wants us to stand out from, like salt and light do. So I thought it would be helpful for us as we think about these two, these metaphors that Jesus uses of salt and light. Let's look at some characteristics of salt and light as, as he is calling us to live as salt and light. Each of these, salt and light, have some, they have some very similar attributes. One of the ways in which they're similar is both of these elements are invasive. They are invasive. And they're invasive in a very good way. They bring about positive change when they are introduced into their environments. When salt is added to food, it invades the food and it enhances it. It brings out flavor. When light is introduced in a dark room, it illuminates things. It brings things out of the shadows, and it highlights the details and the beauty that are in those rooms that are hidden when they are dark. So when we think about that, even, even a little bit of each of these elements goes a long way. A little bit of salt goes a long way. A little bit of light can go a really long way. Another aspect of these two things, salt and light, is that they both are valuable. They have great value, especially in the times in which Jesus spoke these things. In biblical times, Rome, many of the Roman soldiers were actually paid their wages in salt. That's where we get the phrase, not worth, it, not worth his salt, which means basically that someone's work is not worth the pay that they receive. That's where that saying comes from. And it sets the expectation that salt is valuable. The thing about salt in those days, too, it was, it was nowhere near as accessible as it is to us today. It was very difficult to come by. And it was used not only to enhance the flavor of the food that it was introduced to, but it was something that would help the people preserve. It would help them preserve the meat that they had so that that meat would last longer. They were able to get more out of the meat that was there. There was no refrigeration in those times. And so having a little bit of salt and having enough salt to preserve your meat with was a huge luxury because it helped slow down the process of decay. Salt helps slow down the process of decay. Salt is still incredibly valuable to us today. I, I picked up this little nugget from um, the interwebs this week from a site called seasalt.com. I thought I would just share with you this, this is the, basically them advertising sea salt. And it says, the most familiar use of salt undoubtedly is as, is a, as a vital element to the cooking and preparing of great tasting food. We keep salt within reach in the kitchen and at the table as a flavor enhancer. Salt accents the flavor of meat, brings out the individuality of vegetables, puts oomph into the bland starches, deepens the flavor of delicate desserts, and develops the flavor of melons and certain other fruits. No other seasoning has yet been found that can satisfactorily take the place of salt. And light, light is valuable. Light was not easily obtained in Jesus' day, at least not artificially. You couldn't just walk into a room and flip a switch on in Jesus' time. You had to purchase oil. You had to have a container to hold the oil. You had to have a wick, and the wick had to be trimmed, and it had to be maintained. And not to mention, they didn't have big lighters that they could light that with. They had to find a way to light that, and so it wasn't easily attainable. The other thing about light is there are enormous benefits to light 
even beyond just illumination. I have a, I have a close relative who lives in northern Ohio who suffers from this thing called seasonal affect disorder. And many people who live in the north suffer from this. Basically what it is, it's a disorder of the circadian system, which is used for sleep. And, and so when they have this disorder, because of a lack of light in their life, they have to be subject to artificial light in order to overcome the symptoms of this, which are depression. And I understand there's a lot of people that suffer from that. There's some other applications of light that, are, that I think we ought to look at when we think of the value of light. Photosynthesis in plants. Vision and sight, the fact that you and I can see one another is the result of light. Body growth and sleep, drying and evaporation, sanitation, light is used in that, temperature regulation, healthcare uses, communication, electricity generation, and sterilization. All of these are some things that, that light benefits us from. So we, we see this value in both salt and light, unbelievable value. But when salt loses its saltiness, it's useless and it's thrown out. When light is hidden, and we saw that in verse 14, when Jesus said, don't hide the light under a bushel, don't hide it under a basket, don't allow it to be hidden. When it, when it when light is hidden, it loses its purpose. It's not achieving its usefulness. Jesus is reminding us here, he's exhorting us that we too can become ineffective when we become passive, when we live a hidden life in him, when we're not living out our faith. Passivity and conformity right now are diseases and they're cancers with many followers of Jesus and within the church itself so much we see this passivity and conformity to culture these teachings of Jesus to be salt and to be light the mandates they're not suggestions the mandate for us is to get into the game to influence our world for Christ with the truth and to engage our culture not to withdraw from our culture but to engage it Jesus is teaching us we got to reject passivity of our faith we've got to reject conformity to our culture we've got to live counterculturally because neither salt nor light are passive nor do they conform to the environment that they are introduced to to Light does not become like darkness when it's introduced. Salt enhances the flavor of meat. It doesn't make, it doesn't become like the meat. We have to be active in transforming our culture. You and I, the church, we collectively are to be cultivators of culture, not just critics of culture. Let me say that again. We, you and I are to be cultivators of culture, not just critics of culture. To be a cultivator of culture means that we've got to be in the game. We've got to get our hands dirty. We have to bring life and truth where there is death and destruction. And passivity will never accomplish this. Withdrawing from our culture and separating ourselves is not the answer. And certainly conforming to culture is not the answer for us as followers of Jesus. The days we live in are dark. For many, they feel hopeless. And not solely because evil is growing, but by primarily because the salt and the light of the earth, you and me, the church of Jesus Christ, and the rest of his followers, we've lost our saltiness. And our, we're hiding our lights because we become passive and apathetic in our faith. And we are slowly becoming more and more like our culture rather than changing our culture. 
The other thing that, that I find interesting about salt and light as we look about this as, as an example to how we are to live is they both result in change in the environments where they are introduced. And just like that, you and I as followers of Jesus should be change agents for our culture. The other thing, amazing thing about both of these metaphors that Jesus uses is that the introduction of both of these elements into the environments where they're introduced is that they provide preservation. The world needs truth. The world needs illumination and preservation and the flavor of Christ. They need more of that, not less of that. And ultimately, these changes will only come about when Jesus returns because he is the true light. But until then, you and I are to be culture changers. We are to reflect his characteristics, his cult countercultural way of living until he comes again. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus reminds us of this. He says, I, meaning Jesus, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so when Jesus, in our verses that we read today on the Sermon on the Mount, says that you are the light of the world, I believe what he's saying here is that the light that we are to the world is a reflection of him. I think about it a lot like the sun and the moon, right? The moon is a reflection of the sun. The moon reflects the sunlight. And when the sun is hidden, when the sun is absent, the moon provides, can, can light up the skies. As you know, we had a full moon the other night. Was it the strawberry moon? Something like that. But we had a full moon, and it was bright outside. When, it, when the sky is clear, it was reflecting the sun. And I think in a lot of ways, that's what Jesus was talking about. While he's absent, we are to be a reflection of his light in this world. We are to accomplish what he accomplished and modeled in 33 years. He wants us to go on and continue that until he returns one of those days. Jesus also says this about his light in John chapter 3 verses 19 to 21. He says this, this is the judgment that the light, and that's capital L, that's Jesus, the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light. He was rejected. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. If we, the church, as followers of Jesus, are to live this mandate out of being salt and light, you and I have to engage our culture. And, and here's, a, here's a note. When we think about living counterculturally, well, how are we to engage our culture? Like, what are we to do? Well, let's look at our culture in the way that our culture is trying to transform and change. We are to, to do this counterculturally. But when you think about what's happening today and the protests and the destruction that is happening, happening in our world from our culture it, to bring about change, that is not how you and I are to operate. You and I are to go back and look at, at verses 1 through 12. And those characteristics that Jesus mentioned are how you and I are to bring about change in our culture. The way we live counterculturally is we are peacemakers. We are merciful. We love one another. Jesus told us that they will know us by our love for one another. We, we love greatly. We are meek. We live counterculturally. That is how we will bring about the ultimate change in our culture, is living this counterculture way that we talked about two weeks ago, these characteristics. You and I have been called not to live in fear. 
and not to live in retreat mode, moving away from the culture, which is so easy to do. Fear, fear makes us retreat. Fear makes us say, I got to get out of the culture. We're not to get out, we're to engage. But we got to have the confidence that we are sons and we are daughters of the Most High God. And the other great news here is we are not left on our own. It is not by our strength that we're going to be able to do any of this. Jesus himself said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you, the church, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And then in John 14, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And listen to this. And they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Did you catch that? We will do even greater things than Jesus did. Jesus said that. I don't think we live like that. I think we would live with a whole lot more confidence if we believed that, that we would do greater things collectively than even Jesus did here on earth. His church, living out his truths, empowered by the Holy Spirit, will do great and wonderful things, but only if we're engaged, only if we reject passivity, only if we reject apathy, and we get out of drift mode, and we begin engaging. We have to point people to the truth, and we do that by reflecting the truth, reflecting him. There's a theologian, British Anglican priest named John Stott. He's passed away now, but he wrote this, and I want you to hear his words. He says, if the house is dark when nightfall comes, There's no sense in blaming the house. That is what happens when the sun goes down. The question to ask is, where is the light? Similarly, if the meat goes bad and becomes inedible, there's no sense in blaming the meat. This is what happens when bacteria are left alone to breed. The question to ask is, where is the salt? Just so, if society deteriorates, and its standards decline until it becomes like a dark night or a stinking fish. There's no sense in blaming society. That is what happens when fallen men and women are left to themselves, and human selfishness is left unchecked. The question to ask is, where is the church? Why are the salt and light of Jesus Christ not permeating and changing our society. We live in a dark age. We live in difficult times. Biblical truth, Christian values are under attack. How will we, how will the church, you and I, how will the church respond? Will we retreat? Will we live in fear? Will we be complainers? Will we be critics? Or will we live out our mandate to be salt and light. Will we be change agents? Verse 16 told us, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Will our presence in the society in which we live, our influence on culture, will it be permeating permeating and illuminating? Jesus will return one day. And he will restore all that's been lost and broken. But until then, you and I as ambassadors of Jesus Christ can have such great impact and influence on the world. And the way that we do that is we get in the game. We become activated. We swim upstream. We live counterculturally. We point people to the true light because we are a reflection of, of that. Let's embrace this mandate as his followers, as change agents in the culture in which he has placed us. 
Jesus is calling us to be a reflection of him in our broken world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these challenging words of Jesus. God, I'm grateful that this Sermon on the Mount was not a sermon of niceties, but, Father, it was a sermon of challenge and difficulty. Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit, by the power within us that you give us and you give us access to, that we would be culture changers. Father, that we would live counterculturally, that our light would shine in the darkness in which we live. Father, that we would be salt to the tasteless, hopeless feelings and, and, and mindset of our generation. Father, you've given us such incredible, such an incredible mission, such an incredible mandate. And I pray, Father, that each of us would be challenged by this, that we would live differently because of it. And Lord, that you would be glorified, that your church would shine brightly like a, like a light of the city on a hill. Lord, may we reflect your goodness. May we reflect your love. May we reflect your truth in the world that, in which we live. And I pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. from a song I ran across by Carolyn Gillette. A little bit of salt will quickly show its worth. 
A little bit of faithfulness will change the earth. God, make us worth our salt, a church that's glad to be the change that you desire in each community. A lamp that's in a house gives safety, warmth, and light. It's set upon a table where it shines so bright. May we be lamps that glow with love and hope and grace, reflecting Christ's own light in every time and place. And as we go out of here, let me leave you with Jesus' words. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Have a great week. Thanks for being here. Thank you.